chapter 27, The Character of the Law of God. This article appeared in the Signs of the Times, April 15, 1886. David says, The law of the Lord is perfect. Psalm 19, verse 7. Concerning thy testimonies, I have known of old that thou hast founded them forever. Psalm 119, 152. And Paul testifies, The law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Romans 7, verse 12. As the supreme ruler of the universe, God has ordained laws for the government, not only of all living beings, but of all the operations of nature, everything, whether great or small, animate or inanimate, is under fixed laws which cannot be disregarded. There are no exceptions to this rule, for nothing that the divine hand has made has been forgotten by the divine mind. But while everything in nature is governed by natural law, man alone, as an intelligent being, capable of understanding its requirements, is amenable to moral law. To man alone, the crowning work of his creation, God has given a conscience to realize the sacred claims of the divine law, and a heart capable of loving it as holy, just, and good and of man prompt and perfect obedience is required. Yet God does not compel him to obey. He is left a free moral agent. The subject of man's personal responsibility is understood by but few, and yet it is a matter of the greatest importance. We may each obey and live, or we may transgress God's law defy his authority, and receive the punishment that is meet. Then to every soul the question comes home with force, Shall I obey the voice from heaven, the ten words spoken from Sinai, or shall I go with the multitude who trample on that fiery law? To those who love God it will be the highest delight to keep his commandments and to do those things that are pleasing in his sight. But the natural heart hates the law of God and wars against its holy claims. Men shut their souls from the divine light, refusing to walk in it as it shines upon them. They sacrifice purity of heart, the favor of God, and their hope of heaven for selfish gratification or worldly gain. Says the psalmist, The law of the Lord is perfect. Psalm 19.7. How wonderful in its simplicity, its comprehensiveness and perfection is the law of Jehovah. It is so brief that we can easily commit every precept to memory, and yet so far reaching as to express the whole will of God and to take cognizance not only of the outward actions, but of the thoughts and intents the desires and emotions of the heart. Human laws cannot do this. They can deal with the outward actions only. A man may be a transgressor and yet conceal his misdeeds from human eyes. He may be a criminal, a thief, a murderer, or an adulterer, but so long as he is not discovered, the law cannot condemn him as guilty. The law of God takes note of the jealousy, envy, hatred, malignity, revenge, lust, and ambition that surge through the soul but have not found expression in outward action because the opportunity, not the will, has been wanting. And these sinful emotions will be brought into the account in the day when God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Ecclesiastes 12, 14.
God's law is simple. The law of God is simple and easily understood. There are men who proudly boast that they believe only what they can understand, forgetting that there are mysteries in human life and in the manifestation of God's power in the works of nature, mysteries which the deepest philosophy, the most extensive research, is powerless to explain. But there is no mystery in the law of God. All can comprehend the great truths which it embodies. The feeblest intellect can grasp these rules. The most ignorant can regulate the life and form the character after the divine standard. If the children of men would, to the best of their ability, obey this law, they would gain strength of mind and power of discernment to comprehend still more of God's purposes and plans. And this advancement would be continued not only during the present life, but during eternal ages. For however far we may advance in the knowledge of God's wisdom and power, there is always an infinity beyond. The divine law requires us to love God supremely and our neighbor as ourselves. Without the exercise of this love, the highest profession of faith is mere hypocrisy. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is likened to it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments, says Christ, hang all the law and the prophets. Matthew 22, 37 through 40. The law demands perfect obedience. Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. James 2, 10. Not one of these ten precepts can be broken without disloyalty to the God of heaven. The least deviation from its requirements by neglect or willful transgression is sin. And every sin exposes the sinner to the wrath of God. Obedience was the only condition upon which ancient Israel was to receive the fulfillment of the promises which made them the highly favored people of God. And obedience to that law will bring as great blessings to individuals and nations now as it would have brought to the Hebrews. Obedience to the law is essential, not only to our salvation, but to our own happiness and the happiness of all with whom we are connected. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Psalm 119, 165, says the inspired word. Yet finite man will present to the people this holy, just, and good law, this law of liberty, which the Creator himself has adapted to the wants of man as a yoke of bondage, a yoke which no man can bear. But it is the sinner who regards the law as a grievous yoke, it is the transgressor that can see no beauty in its precepts. For the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Romans 8, verse 7. But by the law is the knowledge of sin. Romans 3, verse 20. For sin is the transgression of the law. 1 John 3, 4. It is through the law that men are convicted of sin, and they must feel themselves sinners, exposed to the wrath of God, before they will realize their need of a Savior. Satan is continually at work to lessen men's estimate of the grievous character of sin, and those who trample the law of God under their feet are doing the work of the great deceiver, for they are rejecting the only rule by which they can define sin, and bring it home to the conscience of the transgressor. The law of God reaches to those secret purposes which, though they may be sinful, are often passed over lightly, but which in reality 
are the basis and the test of character. It is the mirror into which the sinner is to look if he would have a correct knowledge of his moral character. And when he sees himself condemned by that great standard of righteousness, his next move must be to repent of his sins and to seek forgiveness through Christ. Failing to do this, many try to break the mirror which reveals their defects to make void the law which points out the blemishes in their life and character. We are living in an age of great wickedness. Multitudes are enslaved by sinful customs and evil habits, and the fetters that bind them are difficult to break. Iniquity like a flood is deluding the earth. Crimes almost too fearful to be mentioned are of daily occurrence, and yet men professing to be watchmen on the walls of Zion will teach that the law was designed for the Jews only and passed away with the glorious privileges that ushered in the gospel age. Is there not a relation between the prevailing lawlessness and crime and the fact that ministers and people hold and teach that the law is no longer of binding force? The condemning power of the law of God extends not only to the things we do, but to the things we do not do. We are not to justify ourselves in omitting to do the things that God requires. We must not only cease to do evil, but we must learn to do well. God has given us powers to be exercised in good works, and if these powers are not put to use, we shall certainly be set down as wicked and slothful servants. We may not have committed grievous sins. Such offenses may not stand registered against us in the books of God, but the fact that our deeds are not recorded as pure, good, elevated, and noble, showing that we have not improved our entrusted talents, places us under condemnation. The law of God existed before man was created. It was adapted to the condition of holy beings. Even angels were governed by it. After the fall, the principles of righteousness were unchanged. Nothing was taken from the law. Not one of its holy precepts could be improved. And as it has existed from the beginning, so will it continue to exist through the ceaseless ages of eternity. Concerning thy testimonies, says the psalmist, I have known of old that thou hast founded them forever. Psalm 119, 152. By this law, which governs angels, which demands purity in the most secret thoughts, desires, and dispositions, and which shall stand fast forever, Psalm 111, verse 8, all the world is to be judged in the rapidly approaching day of God. Transgressors may flatter themselves that the Most High does not know, that the Almighty does not consider. He will not always bear with them. Soon they will receive the reward of their doings, the death that is the wages of sin, while the righteous nation that have kept the law will be ushered through the pearly gates of this celestial city and will be crowned with immortal life and joy in the presence of God and the Lamb.